I used to be editor of a state farm magazine and I watched the um, implementation of industrial agriculture persuade me to get out of the field. I now do a publication called Sustainable Farmer. I have gone to places that are hosted by Farm Bureau, Global Harvest, Crop Life, groups like that, very well funded, and you're perceived and marketed to farmers as a terrorist. Yeah. And I worry, number one, about your safety, and I worry, number two, about changing the national dialogue so you're not perceived as some sort of wild-eyed radical way out of the mainstream. Yeah. And how do you make friends with farmers? Sure. Well, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but the, um, what, what's your name? Bonnie Buckaroo. Yeah, Bonnie said that she used to be involved in agriculture and moved away from industrial agriculture and towards sustainable farming and has entered a publication and goes to a lot of fora where farmers are, are together. And I'll tell you, you know, it's precisely because we've been very strategic and very effective that there's been a brand attack leveled against the Humane Society. And essentially, we've done ballot measures in, in Florida and Arizona, California, not to eliminate animal agriculture, but to stop the most extreme and inhumane practices. And there are folks who would say, just like with dove hunting, you know, well, you just give them an inch, they're going to take a mile, they're going to stop, you know, they're going to stop all animal agriculture, they're going to stop all hunting. Well, the ballot measure on morning dove hunting was just about morning doves. And it was about maintaining a ban on dove hunting that had been in place for decades in the state of Michigan. It was actually a radical move to try to open up a season on birds that had been protected for so long. And the mainstream of Michigan saw through it. And I think the mainstream of American society is seeing through this effort to demonize animal advocates because they're making you know, very narrowly focused arguments about particular abuses. And, you know, we're, we're working hard, you know, when we, we just reached an agreement with the United Egg Producers, which is a trade association for the egg industry on a national agreement to give more space to birds, to stop the practice of forced molting, which is a starvation feed withdrawal program, to extend the laying cycle of the birds, to establish a national uh, labeling program for um, eggs in the marketplace. So more and more we're finding cooperation with farmers, but there are some who don't want that cooperation to occur because they want to continue to do things the way they've been doing them in recent decades. And, you know, we're just not going to stand around and let that happen. And we're going to, to, to contest that notion. Other questions or? Yes, sir. I keep reading you know, every year about the group that goes after the whalers in the southern oceans, you know, the Japanese and their whale hunting. And the Japanese claim is that they're doing research and that's why they, that's why they need to do all this yeah. massive killing. How much research has actually been published, yeah. if any? I yeah. mean, I've, I've never heard of it. Yeah, what's your name? Jim. Yeah, so Jim asked about um, whaling and, and you know, I think Jim, let me just, I want to ease into you, to that answer, but you know, whaling is a great example of how things can change. We were the greatest whaling nation, greatest in the sense of biggest. We we're the biggest whaling nation in the world for quite a long time. And the boats left from Nantucket and New Bedford and other coastal communities in the United States and they plied the world's oceans to kill sperm whales and humpback whales and blue whales and fin whales and right whales and all manner of species. Well, we did it partly just as an economic opportunity that whale oil was fueling our, our new economy, our growing economy in the 18th century, the 19th century. Then, of course, we discovered petroleum in Pennsylvania in the latter part of the 19th century. And, you know, the, the main reason for killing whales fell off. Coincident with that, we had kind of an, a moral awakening about the environment and animals starting in the 19th century. People realized these great creatures should be protected and not harpooned. And we became one of the nations over time that moved into the ranks, the growing ranks, of anti-whaling nations, and we docked the whaling boats. And now in their place we have whale watching ships that go into the world's oceans to bring people to see these animals intact and to leave them intact, leaving the living capital in the ocean to be viewed over and over again to generate money. So now whale watching is practiced by 80 nations of the world. It's more than a $2 billion industry. 
and we just have two or three nations of the world that continue to kill whales for commerce, Japan and Norway, and Iceland a little bit. Now, so many industries that cause harm to animals try to find some rationale to excuse their conduct. And the nations that are doing whaling, you know, try to make the claim that they're whaling, as Jim said, for research purposes. But there's hardly ever anything published, nobody is paying attention to it, <laughs> and it's completely a ruse in order to drive their interest in commercial whaling, which is a traditional activity in Japan. So what's been so interesting, Jim, is that now Norway and Japan are the pariahs of the world community on this. And uh, eventually, I, ho I hope the young people in those countries demand of their, of their elder leaders that we need to get past this as nations and move into the community of nations that respect these great creatures. One or two more questions? Any, yes. I was wondering, why do you think that, to me, everything that we're speaking about, more being there of a big interest, the people that maybe are admirers right now that have heard that it just kind of goes right over their head, what, and of course ourselves, you know, speaking with friends, yeah. family, but it, Yeah, it takes, it takes, you know, all sorts of, of activism in order to create big social reform. You know, look at the history of our nation. I mean, we're a nation that has dealt with many forms of injustice. And, you know, we have very important principles that grounded the formation of our country. You know, we just celebrated about a month ago the, the birthday of our nation, celebrating the Declaration of Independence. We have a Constitution, a Bill of Rights. Within those documents are embedded the values of our nation, many of the values of our nation, justice and fairness. Well, we didn't always sync up our behavior with these values, right? We had chattel slavery, we had child labor, we denied women the right to vote until 1920. It took an amendment to the Constitution 15 decades after the founding of the nation in order for women to get the right to vote. So animals, you know, are, are much more complicated than, than all of those issues because we are in this incredibly powerful position over animals. They're different from us. But I think that all of the trends and all of our kind of ethical frameworks point us in the direction of being better to animals. But it starts with a core group like this in communities across the country and everybody being ambassador and spreading the word, you know, working with the media, working with churches, working with other community-based groups to create this, this clamor for change. And that's what we're doing every day. I mean, we're having to be here today, but we're speaking to churches and other folks who, you know, may be a little bit interested, may be very interested, but don't know about the issues. So, you know, you have to figure out in your life what you can do. Everyone needs to figure out what you can do to advance the cause. Like the younger generation, Yeah, well, everything. We have television ads on, you know, on all the networks are direct response television. I mean, millions of people see those ads every day to spread the word about these issues. Yes? Oh, okay, sorry about that. Um, we have personal knowledge of individuals who are doing the dog fighting in Lansing area. They are willing to testify, however, they're afraid, they're afraid of retaliation from the individuals. What can the Humane Society and Animal Control do to yeah. protect these individuals so they can come forward, so they can be prevented? Yeah, I think we'll probably just have to take that offline with you okay. rather than here, but why don't we talk afterwards? Yes. And uh, I'm going to say in general that we are, uh, we are deeply committed to uh, eradicating dogfighting and cockfighting in America. Right. We have uh, a dedicated unit focused on that. We just did two major busts in North Carolina this week, and we have rewards programs, tip lines, we train thousands of law enforcement officials a year in investigating illegal animal fighting crimes. And uh, we're working not just in Lansing, but also in Washington, D.C. on legislation to strengthen the laws against animal fighting.